Okay, call the meeting to order of the Waitley Select Board of January 13th, 2021. First agenda item minute meeting minutes, approval of the December 30th, 2020 minutes that were in our package for everybody to receive. Any comments? No comments from me. Okay. Uh, we see we got Jonathan in comments on minutes. No. Okay. I make motion we approve minutes of December 30th, 2020. Uh, second. Okay, we'll call vote. Joyce? Yeah, uh, aye, yes. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred, yes. Okay, moving on. Vendor and payroll warrants. They were in our packet information and I think I signed off on them already. Any comments on them? None for me. Nope. Okay. Moving on, uh, public comment sections. Anybody in the, in the public want to comment on items that are not listed on the agenda for this evening? No. Okay. Moving on. Next item is schedule appointments at 6.05. Okay. Veterans Memorial Committee wants to discuss the status of plans for redesigning Veterans Memorial area adjacent to the town hall. I see we have Jim and what Larry on for that. Uh, okay, Jim, I, I guess I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Well, as you, most of you may recall, <clears throat> um, the select board asked us for a redesign about two years ago. Um, we formed a committee of Alan Thackeray, Ray Belisle, Larry Ashman, and myself. Um, we interviewed uh, three landscape designers and decided uh, to use the Conway School of Design. All of the designs were focused on opening up the area um, to, take, to take advantage of a view to the east. The Conway design had the monument um, rotated 180 degrees to face the east. So um, people congregating in that area, like for Memorial Day, will facing the monument and to the east will be the view. So it, it, it kind of reverses everything that we now have. Um, a border was also suggested to define the monument. So we have um, proposed in our plan an 18 foot Goshen stone wall. It's about uh, two feet high, two feet wide, tapered on each end in the form of an arc. And that will go um, in the north east or northwest corner of the, of the lot. Um, the stone will be moved approximately 10 feet from its current location. And, and as again, I said, rotated 180 degrees so it faces the east. The concrete around the stone will be removed and discarded. Um, a, a new flagpole has been installed and we propose uh, ground lighting um, that will be non-obtrusive um, and that will direct the light directly up onto the flag and also provide outlets for um, sound equipment for other occasions in that area. The, the flagpole, the monument, and the, and the new wall, the arc of the new wall, line right up in a, in a straight line, so it's, it's consistent. Around the, the stone, the current monument, will be additional boulders that we will um, attach bronze plaques to with names, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, we've also proposed six granite flat benches uh, so visitors can face the east for the view or west for the ceremonies. The existing benches would be removed. The shrubs will be removed and replaced with low plantings um, and a natural barrier strip will be placed along the eastern border and that's to prevent folks from walking through the area onto uh, Judge Roop's land, which is, has been a problem in the past. Um, the concerning the names, we will, um, on the additional boulders, we will add all of the names um, 
that uh, Ina Kane provided in her research, her Wheatley Historical document uh, of folks who served in the wars previous to World War I, that's the Civil War, War of 1812, um, the, the uh, Revolutionary War, uh, and those names will be uh, taken at face value without any further research that they did come from Waitley and they did serve. It, her research is probably far better than anything we could do. So we're gonna include those names and, and display them. Names subsequent to Vietnam um, it, are very difficult to get. They're covered under privacy laws. The town clerk cannot release them. So we're going to reach out to the community uh, through Facebook, uh, through the scoop, maybe a, a robo message from the town clerk's office encouraging people that if they know any, any individuals who did serve subsequent to Vietnam, uh, for example, in the Gulf Wars, um, Afghanistan, Bosnia, et cetera, uh, to come forth with documents and we will uh, include them if they, if they meet the minimum requirements. Uh, and those minimum requirements mean they must have been a resident when they joined the armed forces they must have served 180 days of continuous service or one day in combat. If there's any um, discussion about that, we will rely on uh, VA qualifications. Uh, they've researched this far better than we can. If you qualified for VA, then you will be on the stone. Um, the weight stone, uh, which is in that area, uh, can remain as is, uh, but the future sidewalks may require it be moved. And we suspect it probably would be moved probably maybe seven or eight feet to the south or further, um, depending on what the planners decide. There's, there's, after meeting with Keith and Brian, there's plenty of room for a sidewalk to uh, enter from the corner of the existing walks in front of the town hall between the flagpole and the monument and exit to the south um, where it's going, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows at this time. We could just kind of guess where it's going to go, but it should not, it should not impede anything we have. We've established flower beds uh, around it, as you can see on the plan, um, and they'll be all low growth. We want to preserve that view. Um, and uh, I think... I think that's all I have at this moment. If you'd like to ask me any questions, please do so. Okay, so the, Jim, the existing, or any more names uh, before the, the war, well, either one before or after what's on there, is that gonna be on a new plaque? Yes, it will. Stone or the same stone? No, they'll be, on, they'll be on new bronze plaques, Fred. They'll be cast onto a bronze plaque yeah. And they will be attached to a flat faced boulder. And that's similar to the design that they've used in Hatfield. They've used it in Chesterfield. They've used it in Berniston. And they've used it in Heath. It's a very common way to do, to expand the names. And that's what we plan on doing. Okay. Okay. And you said that that monument is going to be rotated 180 degrees and it will be facing east. That's correct. So that stone wall you have is going to be between people standing there and the monument? The, the, the stone wall will be on the corner. It will be on the, the north uh, west corner of the, of the area. Right, I see that. The monument will be about 10 feet in front of that, 8 to 10 feet in front of that. Oh, in front of that. Okay, because okay. you show on this diagram a little rectangle. I thought that was the monument, but... What is, is that the, the old monument or new? Um, that is the new one, but it's it's further to the for the east, Fred. It was drawn further. It should be further to the east. Oh, okay. Okay. So that when we have Memorial Day, all right, people will be congregating more to the rear of that lot and not out on Chester Plain Road or in the parking lot. Okay. okay. Just a comment on that big tree. That, that was a stumbling block. We had an arborist look at it and it is called a storm tree. It could last six years, 10 years, or it could go down on the next storm. We don't know. 
but it does give a good deal of shade. It's got a beautiful canopy. And um, when, the, when the town workers erected the new flagpole, they did do some internal trimming, get some dead wood out of it. It needs some more. And we decided we want to keep that tree. And it's even been through a, a town meeting where it, to, to take it down, but uh, Keith is not going to take it down. We're going to leave it where it is for shade. As you know, that's a pretty intense area for sunshine on Memorial Day. Right. And then the sidewalk, the existing asphalt sidewalk, is that the way it is today with that little jog in, from the sidewalk in front of the town hall, or is that going to be moved to make that jog? It's my understanding that asphalt walk in front of Judge Roop's house and going south will be removed, and we will have a vegetated barrier put in place uh, so that we can identify her property from the town property. The other thing that we, we okay. Jim was just at the, um, what meeting was I just in? CPC. CPC. Um, it was just in the CPC meeting and we, ex we encouraged him, if need be, to expand south along the, the public land if, if more space would make it a more user-friendly area um, because we don't want it tightly fit into that sort of like wedging something in sort of a, a forced look we have plenty of land um and and if they feel the need to use it we encourage them to use it right i think that's a good comment because uh, you also i think it's not shown here is the sidewalk on the, the edge of the parking lot that's on the, the left side of your drawing here um, right. right that, that was put in after the after this right. design was done. So that's going to reduce that space there, unless you move it south, like Jonathan is saying. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's a good idea. If you have more more room there, the town property uh, goes south of there. So, okay. Anybody else? It was suggested at the CPC meeting that I post a an enlarged drawing of this on the on the town hall in the front of the town hall, so people can look at it. And um, we should probably have a public gathering to explain to the residents what's going on. Okay. Now, Jim, I recall there was a meeting. I don't know if it was public meeting or whatever, or you had two or three different. Alternative different options for for this area, yeah. uh, including where sidewalks would go and whatever. Was, yeah. was that a public meeting that you got comments on? The uh, the the sidewalks are you're correct that the sidewalks from Conway School of Design were were part of this, and we've deleted all of that. We took oh. the sidewalks out. Oh, okay. Jim, I'm going to encourage you to have the public meeting sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, I, I, and I say that only because we all know that when people feel that things are being cast upon them at the last minute, they get their neck hairs up a little bit. Okay. Um, and also it will give you time to, to, to react depending upon what feedback you get. So I, if it were me, I would do it sooner rather than later. And okay. it's, you know, I will get this drawing expanded, John, I'll put it up on a, a larger, larger board. And then I'll contact Brian and perhaps we can put something together for a town conference. Yeah. And Jim, did your estimate of the cost for this include adding the additional names on these other? At this point, it does not, Fred. Um, we'd be, um, we would welcome any contributions uh, for that. We have no, I, have no, I have no idea what the costs would be. We've, we've already got the costs for the stone wall, the benches, and the landscaping. But I do, and uh, the CPC also asked that I submit another document to run power out to that area, which I'm going to do and, and give that to them. But as far as the plaques go, no, that's not included. We need to um, address that as we go forward, find out how big they're going to be. And I haven't done that yet. Okay. Okay. The other area, the the other thing, just a comment. Uh, when we did the utility work for the town hall, 
it went through some of this area here. I yep. don't know. I assume you're aware of where that is. Yes. Uh, it, it comes off of the, the uh, one part comes off of the uh, telephone pole or utility pole that's there. And the other is for the water connection. Yep. So I assume you're aware of where them, where that is. We are, and I've discussed that with the stonemason, and he said that will not, he will not uh, be on, on top of the uh, conduits. Okay. Because okay. they were clearly marked out when they put the sidewalk in, so I know, I know where they are, and Keith knows as well. Okay, that's good. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any further comments? No, I think they've done a great job. Yeah. Good. Okay, so, yes, you're, so I think it, is to have all this done this this calendar year. I'd hope to have it done for Memorial Day, but I don't think town meeting is going to cooperate. No. <laughs> oh. Because we're ready to go as soon as the funding is available. The stone wall will go in, um, and we'll get the town to get that monument moved and I, the benches are on, I can get them at any time. They're rolling it over in South Hadley and I can go and get them myself. How long does it take to finish it, Jim? To finish this project? Yeah, to do it, to, to once, the, once the check is written, how, much, how long does it take? A couple of weeks. Hey, Brian, can we, because it's CPC money that's being used is there a way to have to, to not wait until July 1st? Assuming town meeting approves. Without looking at the, the CPC bucket allocations, um, it, it's, possible, yeah. it's possible. It's possible. I think one of the things we need to figure out is, is if the sidewalk's coming through, um, where is it coming through? How much is that going to cost? Um, I think there's some elements that we still need to, to hammer out here. Right. Um, but okay. can, it's possible. Can, can other funds be used between now and, and, and July 1 and then that account reimbursed with CPC funds? No, because you don't know if it's going to be approved, Fred. Well, right, but I, I mean, you're taking a chance. It, it, but is that an option to CPC to to put money back into this other account? If, they, if it's approved, I understand it needs to be approved. But if it is approved, is that an option? I don't. I don't know of any funds that we currently have appropriated that 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 would fit what the purpose of this is for. Right, and and we can't use CPC money for a project that has not been approved. Okay. But I mean, I'd, I'd love to expedite it to the extent possible, but we, we, can, we can look into once it is approved, whether we can borrow against certain funds to, to, to get the thing done, because it, you know, it'd be, it'd be a shame to not have it usable during the, obviously the, the best weather months of the year. All right. And is Jim, is there other uh, veterans funds available you could use? Or? There's um, there was a uh, a gift from Ruth Leahy in memory of her late husband, Tom. Okay. And there's I think there's like twenty one hundred dollars in that. There's also a special revenue account with about twenty twenty two or twenty three hundred dollars that I noticed. Um, so that that money's available as well. But from say Veterans Administration, do they have any money? I doubt it. I, I, I haven't looked into that, Fred. Okay. Well, okay, so you'll put this out uh, for the public to look at on a larger scale and then consider comments you've got, you received and uh, come back with a final proposal to the board. Yeah. And, and also to what, CPC, do they need a final proposal as well? No, like they've got everything they need to, to make a decision. Recreation Commission approved it. Okay. 
Um, and, you know, the plan that we have, I'll just blow it up so it's a little larger and try to put things perhaps more in perspective. Okay, but so CPC did approve it? The CPC has not approved it yet. The Historical Commission approved it yeah. and the Recreation Commission approved it. And Jim, I'm going to put you on an open space committee um, agenda in the not too distant future as well. Okay. Okay. So, what is CPC waiting for? Final the final plan? No, they're they've got everything that they need. Um, they just asked for an additional document on the electrical hookups, which I will I will get immediately for you. But I've got no further information to give to CPC. I gave them everything they asked for. Okay, sounds good. Okay, anybody else comments? Anything? Uh, just to just to just to follow up, I, I think next steps will be Jim's going to get the the plan blown up, and and hopefully we can post that somewhere under shelter um, at the town hall. Uh, hopefully, so if people want to see a larger plan, uh, they could walk up and see it. Um, I think we'll get. You will figure out a date um, to have a virtual public meeting. I think that's probably the best way to do it. We can make plans. We'll we'll post the plans um, on the website. We'll include places or information as to um, so people know how they can provide public comments if they can't make the meeting. Um, and we'll just I think go from there. And it, the committee hopefully gets some suggestions as to. Um, suggestions to consider and, and they'll be back, I think, with the the modified plan. I think that seems like what our next steps are, right, Jim? Yep. Agreed. <laughs> okay. Sounds good, Jim. Good work. Okay. Thank Keep you. Going on it and hopefully we'll see something soon. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna leave now. Thanks, okay. Jim. Moving on our agenda. Next item is uh, COVID-19 state of emergency. Uh, the two items on here. Uh, one is talk about if we need modifications to the existing town directives. And the other is for uh, paid leave provisions. Okay, Brian. Yeah, so I, I think I'm at least want to have the discussion. Um, so one part of the FFCRA, that's the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, uh, was an employee paid leave provision and that sunsetted according to the law on uh, December 31st, 2020. Um, so really just to summarize what that did, it, it provided 80 hours of um, paid medical leave for employees who were either directed to quarantine or, or taking care or who had COVID-19 symptoms or had COVID-19. Um, the other part, um, and that was at full pay, it was another 80 hours that were available that employers were required to pay uh, to employees to care for an individual subject to quarantine um, or for someone who was taking care of a child whose school or child care provider were closed due to COVID-19. And then there was what was called the Expanded Family Medical Leave Act provision. And that provided um, 400 hours, so so 10 weeks, assuming it's a 40 hour work week, um, family medical leave for a parent whose child, um, whose school or, or daycare provider or child care provider is closed due to COVID-19. Those are the three main provisions of the Paid Leave Act and those are no longer in force. Um, so in terms of how we administered that uh, with our situations that we had um, internally, um, we interpreted that as um, in the couple situations that we had is that we were to pay these people, these employees who qualified for this under um, the FFCRA, but that no longer exists. Um, so the obligation is gone. Um, so in the absence of, of, of the federal directive, we would revert back to our um, typical sick leave policies and other leave policies that the town has. Um, 
so I wasn't sure if there was, I just wanted to have that discussion because that's, that obligation has gone now. Um, and is, I guess the question is, is reverting back to our, our sick leave policies, what this board wants to do? Um, I had a conversation with the school, the school's in negotiations with unions as to how they may or may not extend some of these provisions. Um, so I guess I just was looking for direction. If, if the situation were to arise within the town, hopefully it never does, how, how are we going to handle that administratively? So, I, I, go ahead. I would, Brian, I, 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 I appreciate the comment you made about not wanting to have someone decide between going back to work and potentially getting others sick. Um, I, I think that we need to do everything in our power to make sure that this does not spread and we should not be putting people uh, in, in the decision-making mindset of their salary versus their, you know, their and other people's safety. That being said, um, if people do stay home, I think we need to be very diligent about enforcing doctor's notes and, and or, 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 or um, board of health letters about, about tracing or something so that people can demonstrate that, um, that it's that it's a that it's an issue in their household. Well, that that brings up, I guess, a, a kind of thought I had. If it's in their household, and the household is quarantined because of an individual or exposure to somebody else, does that mean that that person should be compensated somehow rather than coming to work? They can't go to work. Right, but if they're they're quarantined because of the household, not because of the individual. It, it, was that a, a distinction before? Did no. that matter? No? Okay. Under the under the 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 provisions of the FFCRA that are that are now expired, that was not a consideration. It was if they're subject to a lawful quarantine order, then then they were to, they were to be provided the, the the paid medical leave. And I guess I don't see why we why we would do anything different. But I'm sorry, Joyce, you're about to say something. You're muted, Joyce. I was having some feedback earlier, so I muted myself. Okay. Um, I feel like this. I mean, many of our employees are working from home anyway and can work from home. Um, so I think if, I mean, it, it might be too much to kind of pull out a whole decision tree, um, but for people who can work at home and they don't have to come into the town offices, as long as they're, they themselves aren't having the, the symptoms and that would interfere with their work, I, I would like to find a way to make that you know, still be, you know, no, no, you're, you're still working. Um, but I can see sort of two situations where I think they really ought to provide the paid leave, which would be if somebody's job requires them to actually go into work and then like highway crew, they can't do their work remotely. Um, police can really not do most of their work remotely. Um, Lynn say for a lot of things she has to actually access the computers in the town office. I don't want her coming in if her household is under quarantine. Um, but what? But she can do some of her work at home, right? Uh, so I have a lot of faith in our employees that they would not abuse this kind of system. Um, but it seems to me like I wouldn't want, I, I would really like to encourage people not to come in when they're at risk, to, when they know they're an increased risk for spreading it or have symptoms. And I'd like them to not have to decide between a paycheck and which which people need, right? Um, and uh, coming in and potentially increasing a spread. Uh, numbers throughout the state are just going up and up and up. You know, not necessarily we're not Los Angeles County yet, <laughs> but they're going up. 
and I think this is one thing we can do. Um, and I, I guess I feel uh, I trust enough. Um, I think there's enough goodwill with our employees um, that if they can work from home, they will work from home. That this isn't going to be abused for people to take two weeks off and go to Florida for Disney World or whatever happens to be open. Um, so in whatever modified form, I'd like to at least hold up the spirit of the um, the paid leave uh, for for COVID. You know, so what, uh, I think some of the things that Brian wrote um, kind of hint at ways to kind of modify it so that it really is for COVID and keeping the chances of spreading as low as we can humanly do. So I guess that's probably more than I needed to say, but I, I guess I'm, I'm amenable to, to some um, modified form of, of this to become a policy for us, even though it's no longer required by law. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess I think we should develop something, a policy to address this. And I think Brian has got several concerns that he mentioned to us already that maybe we could put in that policy or put it as options and we can talk about it further, I guess, before we adopt the policy. Yeah, but I think we have the, I would think we have the, the groundwork for a policy. I'm, I'm, 100% on board with everything that Joyce said, so. Okay. So do we want to see a policy for our next meeting to vote on? Well. If that's reasonable on Brian's timetable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I can get something together for the for the following meeting. What um, happens in the interim? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I have the, the principles of, of the policy down. Um, I, I just wonder whether there's there's some mechanism where we can we can ad adopt a can we give Brian discretion until something for the next two weeks until we have the opportunity to formally adopt something. Or is that, I don't want to, Brian, I don't want to put you in an awkward position either. Yeah. Or, or we could always just leave open that if, that if something were to arise, we could call a very quick, a very mm -hmm. quick special meeting at the select board. And I can, I, I could draft up, fast mm -hmm. forward the policy writing if it's not already done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that seems reasonable. If it becomes a problem, let's take care of it, but right. yeah. And one other thought, are we relying on what, Board of Health to tell us when these cases occur? Yeah, how, the way- How are we knowing, and how are we knowing for one, and how we know when the say quarantine period ends? Is there some, who, who's yeah. telling who about that? So, so, the, so the state has a tracking system um, for infectious disease it existed before COVID. Um, it's called the MAVEN system. Um, I will, I'll butcher what it, what those, init, what those letters stand for, uh, but it, it tracks infectious disease and, and that's the reporting system. Uh, Board of Health members and um, our health agent and our public health nurse um, who are hired through the Foothills Health District have access to the MAVEN system. Um, they check it probably two or three times a day um, in cases pop up, um, by address. So that's how it, it's, that's how it's communicated to us. Then our public health nurse will reach out to the people who have tested positive. They'll, they'll talk to them about, about the isolation that needs to happen. Um, timing, those types of things. Um, okay. So we have a system in place that, that works pretty accurately to for information i guess yeah I, I think it like a lot of things early in early on in the process there were some bumps in the road but yeah. i think it, it smoothed itself out 
Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Moving on to old business. Uh, discuss and vote and approve a lease purchase agreement for the wood chipper. Now, Brian, didn't we talk about this at our last meeting? Yep. So at the last meeting, you approved the um, uh, the financing proposal. This is the actual lease purchase agreement that's in your packet. Um, it's essentially the same thing. It's just a, a formality unless we want to change our decision or anybody has any questions. No, I, I don't want to, I don't want to rehash what we've already discussed. Yeah. I would move we vote to approve the lease purchase agreement for the wood chipper. I would second it. Okay, we'll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yes. Fred? Yes. So is this something we have to sign again, Brian? Or did we sign? Um, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a document that needs to be signed. Okay. Okay, moving on to new business. Uh, first item, discuss vote on a mileage reimbursement for calendar year 21. I understand the, the mileage rate went down what, a penny and a half. Yep. Based on the federal mileage rate, I guess went down. Okay. That's what we always do. So I would make a motion to adopt that policy. I'd second that. Okay, any discussion? Brian, anything else? No. That? No. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Jonathan? Yes. Joyce? Aye. Fred? Yes. Okay, next item. New business to discuss and vote to appoint voting delegates for the MIIA and MMA annual business meeting. And I think, Brian, you, you sent us some information. I guess I didn't get anything before that. Any invite or anything to the meeting? Uh, no. So I, I don't know what their method of, of outreach was, other than to town administrators, I guess. I don't know. They sent it. They sent twenty-five invitations to me, Fred. So apparently. Oh yeah. Or, or check your, I was inundated. Check your. I check your junk folder, maybe, Fred. Uh, I, I, unless it was from somebody I didn't recognize and it just went to junk, I don't know. You might have gone to your waitly.org email. Yeah. And then I don't know how you set up to check that if you check you log in separately or not. Right. But. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we need to appoint a, a delegates for a delegates for that. So I think in the past we traditionally been what Brian has been our delegate for that. Yeah. So and there's no lunch this year, Brian, for you to oh no, that's a different that's a different one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Maya's the lunch, yeah. Maya's the lunch. Too bad. <laughs> Maybe they'll deliver it. Right. They should. Now, I won't be able to go myself, so I could I would not be an alternate. Uh are you planning to go, John? Uh, I'm gonna be in and out. Okay. And I think the reliable one would be Brian, right? Yes. I don't. I don't plan on going either. So the reliable one and the much preferred one. Yes. Okay. Well, then I move we appoint Brian as our delegate uh, at the uh, MIAA and MMA annual business meetings. Second. Okay. All those uh, roll call vote in favor, Jonathan. Yeah. Joyce. Aye. Yes, Fred. Yes. I I prepared an acceptance speech. Okay. Do you want to hear it? You've got 45 minutes for your acceptance. <laughs> we'll put it in the record. <laughs> in the congressional record. Yeah, all right. Okay, moving on, town administrator updates. Brian? Um, so I'll, I'll jump around a little bit, but I think I sent the board a notice that the Williamsburg Road has been reopened. Uh, right. The bridges have been fixed and the Guardrail's been installed and uh, the road is now reopened for vehicular traffic. If you're driving the road, please be careful because I uh, think people still walk it. So, um, but the, the bridges are open to vehicle traffic now and pedestrian traffic. Um, I just wanted to kind of keep these in the back of our minds with the Green Communities Grant. Um, there's two there's two rounds now. One is spring of 2021. They haven't released the uh, the notice of funding yet, and then there'll be another one in the fall. Uh, so we're still trying to figure out what to do with 
or what to apply for for that grant. Um, there's also it's and not as a reminder, Brian, solar is not allowed, right? Right. The solar, yep, funding solar PV is not. Okay. But not allowed. Brian, did we apply for a grant for the school, the elementary school? You had, you had quite a few uh, improvements being proposed. Was that in a grant somewhere or not? Last year, we were not able to pull them together um, in the aftermath of the COVID 19 response. Okay. Uh, so we did not apply last year. So is that something we should be looking at this year? Um, it's a possibility. I don't know how how interested how interested the school is in having, because we would need to have some consultants come through. Um, but it, it could be a possibility. Um, the other the other thing to look at is, is um, anything to do with our water system or water department. Um, it's one of the top three energy users in the town. It's the elementary school, it's the town offices, and it's the uh, essentially the pump house on Chestnut Plain. Yeah. Um, I'd ask Wayne to take a look into what might be done with the water system in terms of pumps and um, motors and, and things like that and different drives. Um, I think he had some preliminary conversations with, with one of the engineers he's working with, but um, we're still talking about that. You know, it strikes me that with the increased demand by 48, was it 48 homes and what businesses something? through yeah. the merger, that that might be a, a, a because again, the, the, the electricity demand is not going to go down because of, because of those additions. And, and it's the opportune time to make sure that the system is working as efficiently as possible. Yeah, would they let um, would they let you do any battery storage there? Uh, I mean, we could if we could somehow get uh, solar put up. We're using different funds. Could any of these funds be used for battery storage? I think storage is an eligible expense. Sounds like it would be hard to coordinate that if we don't have also a plan in hand to put up some solar. But that's a real, right. you know, that to me that's. That's a place where if we could generate our own energy, so to speak, um, it would only really be useful if we could also store it. And uh, right. uh, so that's um, uh, that's what my thinking was, but maybe that's sort of a half formed thought and not really ready for prime time. Okay. Well, the, the, the energy committee has a meeting scheduled for next Tuesday. I don't know whether that is an opportune time to, I mean, I would be happy to, to, and if Nat's listening in the corner of the room where we can't see him, um, yeah. you know, it, we, we could discuss different ideas that people have sort of as a, as a, and, you know, throw spaghetti against the wall and see what makes sense for it to stick. Mm. Um, so we could ask the energy committee to put this on their agenda for Tuesday. See if yeah. they're amenable. Well, I created the agenda today, so I can revise it tomorrow. <laughs> if I, I need to be reminded to revise it tomorrow, though, otherwise the chances of it happening are pretty slim. Now, if we're going to continue, I guess, with the water merger this calendar year, I don't know if there's a differences in the, in the type of pumps that they could put in there. Uh, whether some are more efficient than, than others and whether that increased cost would be something we could apply for. Because I think, Brian, you were talking about the existing pump station, right? Yeah, one of the, one of the evaluation criteria for green communities is that, is that the, the activities you're doing, well, at least in terms of energy conservation, uh, is that, is that the, you're, they're looking for energy savings to really right. pay off oh. during the useful life of the equipment. So um, I've actually never thought about it in that context, but um, the new construction wouldn't work in, in the way that I was thinking about it, but I can, I can double check. Right. Yeah. Unless there's like a, a, we, we budgeted for a less efficient pump because it was cheaper. I would think the older pumps might be targets um, if we could replace older, less efficient pumps with newer ones, but 
we'd need some way to evaluate whether our pumps, you know, what would be the difference in efficiency and right. what would the savings be? Right. Or, or how about our the town office building? Is there any upgrades could be made there for efficiencies? I, I don't know off the top of my head. We would have to, we would have to probably bring somebody in to do an energy assessment. You okay here? When is the when is the grant due, Brian? I have to share my answer. So thankfully they split it into two into two rounds. Uh, in the past it used to be just in the spring. They were guessing by the end of January they're going to issue the the notice of funding. So now it's going to be in the spring, a round in the spring and a round in the fall. But we're eligible. I think we can apply for one. Will we know? Will we year. know by? Will we know about round one before we have to apply for round two? I would think so. And can we apply to round two if we get a yes for round one? I wouldn't think so. No, I think they're going to fund one per calendar year, essentially. Okay. One per fiscal year of funding. Does that, if that makes any sense? Then I think we should, we should push to have a concept with supporting data for round one in case we get dinged then we have a second shot at the at, at the apple yeah that makes so, sense to me too if anybody has any ideas other than pump house efficiency battery storage um ev charging stations have other have other grant options that was next on my list to talk about okay so I'll, I'll put those two in the back of my mind and, and on the agenda so I don't forget. But if anybody has any other ideas, um, please shoot me an email by, you know, noon tomorrow. Okay. Yep. So, uh, so in terms of EV charging stations, um, there was a new, there's a new grant program that came out. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have a call with, um, one of the one of the people at FERCOG to, to talk about the pro, talk about the grant program a little more in detail um, and to see what technical assistance they might provide to us in the grant application. So I should have more information about that. Um, but in terms of in terms of locations, I mean it, it's it's pretty wide open. Um, you really just have to own property somewhere um, and make the case as as to why. Um, why these should go there. There's obviously some conditions that needs to be available. I think it needs to be available 24 seven. Um, at least one of the programs that I was looking at needs to be available 24 seven, needs to be open to the public, um, those types of things. So um, there, was a, there was a question that I, that I heard that talked about um, uh, public versus private lands and, and how how that's distinguished and what's possible and not possible in a grant proposal. Do you dug it, dug into that at all? Um, no, I, I haven't. Um, I know one of the, I think one of the programs was, there's a couple different programs that came out in that email. Um, so I, I think one of them does apply to like multifamily residences and stuff like that. And I don't know that there would be a public access requirement there. Um, but hopefully, I'll have a little bit more information on after Friday. Okay. If you could shoot me and Nat and Paul an email on that when you get it. Yep. Um, so that we don't have, you know, telephone line, you know, five, five, five things of separation and, and I muddle the story. Yep. So Brian, can, can these be on private property? Or not? I think one of the programs would allow it on private property. So um, yeah. That makes me think of the blue school. That if they're going to put in 10 apartments, maybe it'd be good to put the infrastructure in for some charging stations. There. There's still a tremendous amount of faith in the blue school development actually happening. Yeah. But, well, but, you know, I'm just saying it's an idea that came to mind yeah, and it no. will happen at some point. But haven't, haven't we asked or has it been asked for the, the truck stop and the uh, park and ride lot already? Well, park and ride lot's going to be going to be going in fast charging. 
Um, it's it's within it's it's just a question of when, but that's that's a done deal, and okay, that's the Department of Transportation. Okay, but how about the truck stop? I didn't talk to the Department of Transportation about the truck stop because it's not our property. So, right, but, but I would I would think yeah. if you want, I, I don't that know. might be a, a location for them to pursue for yeah, us to pursue a privately owned, right? Um, good location for a charging station, right? And it seems people have. If they have something else to do while they're there, it, it, it's yeah. Oh, I love no. It, it's great. Maybe we should approach them again. I think they turned us down last time. We we wanted to try and do that, but they did. Uh, did about a year and a half ago, I think we we reached out to their corporate office and suggested we partner. We, and we keep asking though, and one of these days they're gonna <laughs> get confused and say yes. I don't. I don't remember that we asked. What was their reason for saying no? I'd have to I'd have to look back at the emails. Um, Unless it's their plan to put it in as, as as a revenue stream, which is fine if they want to do that. But yeah, yeah. But, well, yeah. Let's just keep asking them until they get really tired of it, and then finally they will relent. Yeah. We need the Tesla trucks. Yeah. Another another location is at Muffins. You know, in their parking lot. If you had it there, people go in and buy coffee and whatever. Mm. Oh, that's a, that's true. Muffins might be another private location. Yeah. That might fit one of these grants. Yeah. Um, there's probably no space at town hall. But there is space at the town offices. Not that anyone hangs out there for, well, you know, meetings when they rear well, their ugly head meeting. again. Yeah, I don't know. The you know are, there are several options, but right. we'll, we're going to discuss. That's on the, that's a prime topic of discussion for next Tuesday, so. Yeah. Now I'm still pulling for the police station so that it's there when we get our new electric police car in 2023. Right. <laughs> okay. Or new fire trucks, they could go over there and charge. Okay. All right. Okay, Brian, um, continue. So there's those. Um, town hall exterior lighting, that's sort of an ongoing issue we're trying to deal with. Um, we had, if you recall, we had complaints from the neighbors about the, the parking lot light it was too bright. Um, I think it was a um, sodium halogen or sodium halon or something like that was originally there and it was shining on, on a neighbor's house. And then we asked every source to replace it with an LED light, which, <laughs> which shone bright light on another abutter's house. We asked them to downsize the light and they downsized the light. And it's still, we still had concerns from the abutters. Um, so we had asked them to shut it off while we experimented with different, uh, different scenarios. Uh, and really, that's it's still a work in progress. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, but we hope to have some solutions soon. One of the, so one of the options is to is to possibly explore the uh, taller post lights in in to replace the wood the existing wooden post lights that are in front. Um, so that's one thing that that's sort of being discussed between myself, Keith, um, Neil Abrams. There's some emails going back and forth. One of the challenges of that is again, there's a conserva uh, conservation, historic preservation restriction on the property. So any cha any changes to the property need to go through the Mass Historic Commission. So it's <laughs> it's a work in progress. But okay. um, and then Jonathan, I don't know if we want to touch a little bit on the the housing discussion that happened um, at the CPC meeting. Sure. Um, so I think. I think we may have all seen emails talking about the idea of an emergency rental assistance program um, with either CPC, uh, CPA housing funds or um, already appropriated housing trust funds. Uh, Fred, you're on the, the housing committee. Um, and um, Fred Barron and Richard Tilburg and Catherine Wolkowitz. Um, so I don't I don't know Jonathan what was the result of the meeting I had to jump off. Well, there there wasn't earlier. really a result other than people want to move forward. I I am, am pushing the CPC um, to not wait for the housing committee to make a decision whether they want to do it. Um, but I, I was pushing that the CPC would would push to have a um, a special town meeting schedule where they could appropriate some of their money. Um, the but it's clear that the CPC and you know it's not it, as you know they're right as residents that 
our housing committee needs to be more active than it has been over the past year. Um, and, and so I think that as residents, they are, you know, not as the committee necessarily, but as the, as residents, they are correct in, 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 in trying to encourage us to find new members of the housing committee to make sure that we have an active delegation for lack of a better term. Um, the, and, and I think we should, and, and I reminded them that, you know, finding committee volunteers is easier said than done, but, you know, we should certainly put it out there. Um, you know, the, the, the CPC, the members of the CPC would like to see um, housing money used for rental, emergency rental assistance in, in the, during the COVID crisis, which makes all the sense in the world. Um, but I, I, I think that the conversation should take place with a fully functional, and if it is fully functional, great, um, a fully functional housing committee um, and not in a vacuum of there's never going to be housing initiatives that take place, but making sure that we maintain our eye on the ball of needing to develop low income housing. But we, we you know, so the, essentially it was select board, can you, can you please consider how to um, either get the housing committee to meet or um, if people have lost their, their enthusiasm and energy because they're burnt out or whatever, and it happens to all of us, um, find replacement parts for the housing committee. Um, you know, as an aside, I, I know that I have been driving past old, run-down, beat-up buildings uh, near LaSalle Florist for the last few months, knowing that or believing that those are prime locations for low-income housing. Um, one building, is, you know, it's it's a demo. Um, there's wetlands behind it and things like that that you have to worry about. But I guess my point is, is that I think that to do it right, the housing committee should have should be energized to have conversations with the CPC to see how they can collectively um, meet the needs of an unknown demand for rental rental assistance right now during COVID. So we need we need volunteers, or we need the housing committee to um, to meet one or the other. So Jonathan, was anybody from housing committee at this meeting? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I as a member of the housing committee, I, I I agree with everything you're saying that we, for one, we need more members on the housing committee. I think there's two vacancies currently exist, and. Uh, we haven't met in a while, well, even remotely. Uh, I've tried to reach out to chairperson and others and have got really minimal, if any, response. Uh, there, there has been things going on in the housing committee uh, that maybe everybody is, isn't aware of. Uh, you know, we established a housing trust so we could act quickly if we needed to, to purchase or, or fund something uh, because we missed an opportunity to do that. And, and at that time, there wasn't as much, there wasn't much money in the housing trust or in the bucket from CPC for that. So we couldn't really do much for housing. Uh, now there is money in there. And I think we're, we're looking we already got a, what's a DLTA contract or agreement with with FERCOG to look at that. What are the housing needs and, and of the town, and what are people interested in? What what's what's available? What isn't? Uh, and, and how can the housing committee uh, gain input? So that is that is happening now. That study is starting. So it's not like because we haven't met. It's not like nothing is going on. Uh, I think FERCOG is, is, is starting that, that process to, to do that. So, and, and the other thing, you know, if there's, if there's a need for rental assistance, you know, we have two rental units in town. You know, only two that I'm aware of at this Mike's house. Uh, our, our Franklin County, uh, well, Regional Housing Authority 
manages that for us. We get nothing out of that. And if there was an issue with the renters paying rent there, they should say something uh, either to the town or, or, or the housing committee. The housing committee has worked with that regional housing authority. And of course we, we are through Franklin County, through COG, we are working with them as well. So they, they're aware there's a housing committee in town that manages that, that property. And if there is a problem, they should come to the, to the town. They know who to contact. We haven't received anything. At least the housing committee hasn't. I don't know if Brian has got anything <clears throat> from him recently, but uh, so there, there is kind of stuff going on in the background, but, and we haven't decided on what we want to do in the future. And I, I agree with your, your I, I know the location you're talking about and I, and I have a, a vision to do something in that, in that area as, as well. And it's kind of why we're saving up some of our money, uh, talking informally to property owners, there, there's activity going on. Uh, nothing formal, nothing we can announce yet, but that is, is, that is an option that's being considered by the housing committee. Some members of the housing committee are aware of that. Well, I, and, and I've had conversations with the housing committee about that location and, and we should, Fred, we should, we should talk about that because I think it is a viable place, but yeah. keep in mind also that the, the rental assistant, the emergency rental assistance is not just rental assistance and, and Brian's going to know um, chapter and verse better than I am probably, but the emergency assistance is not just for public people in um, town town certified low income housing. It is for anyone who has a rental unit in any community. And um, research was done that there are eighty rental units in in, in Waitley. Okay. So and and I'm not saying yay or nay. I'm just saying that I I think I would encourage the housing committee of however it's constituted and the CPC to get together and say, let's have a joint meeting to talk, to, to talk about potential avenues uh, if there's interest in uh, pursuing. Okay, that's, that sounds good. And, I, I, and part of it also is there's a consultant that's been retained by Hadley among other communities um, that would um, do the legwork on our behalf to find out if there is a need, if there is demand um, for assistance, because we obviously don't know, but there may be, um, and and we're remiss to to try to to try to scout that out, um, because you know some people aren't really eager to raise their hand and say, hey, I can't pay my rent, can somebody help me? Sometimes they need to have someone come to them and say, hey, it seems like you might be having trouble. Can we help you? Um, it's it's a very different dynamic. Um, so I, I would really encourage the housing committee, whatever, however it's constituted, to sit down with CPC and, um, and talk about if and if, and then if is a yes, how um, to, to go about doing that. Well, I guess that, that's, a, that's an option, but I, I guess I'm not, I'm not chair of the committee and, and Brian isn't directly involved with it either. So it's a matter of uh, somebody initiate. We tried, I guess, to initiate some some exchange and some committee activity, but it's. Mm -hmm. I guess we're we're into the, the the COVID issues. I guess for some of the members, and it's hard to. Yeah. I, I don't know. No, we can. We can even do. Yeah, try calling I, I know. the meeting on I, Zoom and see, I, I, see what we can do. They haven't met in a while. It just seems like the first reasonable step is for the housing committee to meet with or without the CPC um, and just see what people think. And, okay. and maybe the idea the CPC has is completely, uh, you know, completely bogus or something. I, I don't know. I didn't really hear it, but I do know people struggle with rent yeah. in this economy and it certainly could be something where it'd be a good use of funds to keep somebody from becoming homeless. Right. And do it and doing it overtly as opposed to waiting for someone to raise their hand and they may be embarrassed to do so. Yeah. But, yeah. but even even if we even if we have the, the 80 units and I don't know where that come from, uh, I'm aware there is rental units and I guess we could find out on our own database, but 
you know, we're not a we're not a Sunderland or an Amherst or Hadley that has significant rental units at, at the maybe I'm saying at the lower income levels, lower rent levels, where maybe there's more of a need. You know, just because but that's ten percent of, of our that, households, then, right? That we have, we I only deliver the scoop to less than seven hundred and fifty households. Yeah. Right. So um, eighty. That's ten percent. Right. And, and maybe if it's not all low income housing, very little of it is, but that doesn't mean people won't struggle to pay the rent if they've been laid off. Right. Okay, well. And, and Fred, as, as it was pointed out in the CPC meeting earlier today, um, and it's a very valid point, we don't know the demand, but if it turns out we can help one family avoid eviction because they've been laid off and they can't pay the rent, well then, that's that's a good day's work. Okay. You know, if, if you if you don't want to call Fred, I'll call Fred, Baron. No, say, I. Hey, Fred, do you want to do this? I, or or you know, you do it. But I just someone's got to take the leadership because there. It, it strikes me that there that that it's the everyone's looking to, and and I and I could be wrong, Fred, and I apologize if I'm if I'm speaking out of turn. But it just strikes me that maybe everyone's looking at each other saying, you know, somebody else can can take the leadership role. I, I just think it requires someone to say, hey, let's meet. It, 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 it's sort of like the energy committee. We all look at each other and say, okay, who's gonna call the next meeting? And then somebody, somebody finally says, let's do it. It's the same thing. Okay, I, I hear what you're saying. We'll try, I'll try to get the committee going and, and see what we can, we can come up with, uh, but you know, it, it could be a good program, but I, I think the energy, uh, the housing committee needs to be involved and look at the needs for our town and not just because uh, surrounding communities or the state or there's money available to, to do that. I, I think we need to have a better approach to it, so. Okay. Okay, right. Brian, what, what else? You have, uh... I think that's pretty much it. Hey, Brian, when's yep. the LTA coming out for, for the next round? It was in the state budget. I'm, I'm not sure when Trocog's going to send it out, but it, it's usually well, it's usually in January when they when they solicit for projects. Just to put it on people's radar screen, um, there's a there's a working group that's been constituted to um, to perform needs assessment for a, a, a new town, a new senior center. Um, and that needs assessment could be funded by DLTA money. And I know that there's gonna be a push in the towns of Sunderland and Deerfield, whether they're successful or not, I, you know, who knows, but there will be a push to have that their number one priority. Um, and I know that I'll be making that push for the next round of DLT. And I know there's gonna be competition um, open space committee had, you know, it was recommended that we we make a push for that for something from there. Um, so, you know, there is competition, but um, we have we seem to have some enthusiasm for uh, mm -hmm. for doing a needs assessment for on behalf of our seniors. Um, just to put that in the back of people's heads that it, it may be something that we want to we want to really get behind. And if there's competition for those dollars and it's not a lot of dollars to begin with so I you know um, maybe maybe we as a group can can get behind the, the senior center assessment uh, this this time around when that comes out and get it done quickly there's been rumors that that Conway might may um, and I don't want to speak for them may be uh, interested in participating in a needs assessment as well um, you know they're a pretty big geographic distribution and they're close to Shelburne they're close to Ashfield and they're close to um, us. <laughs> us. So in Deerfield. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a split dynamic. But again, I just want to throw that out there that when it when it gets out, I'd like to get that on the agenda quickly. Because we, we really do need a needs assessment because in my opinion, and I haven't been shy about that, as much as I hate to say it about historical buildings, that one's a dump. And it doesn't serve our seniors well at all. No. This is just a board of oversight. This. No, this is the Board of Oversight, along with other people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they've contacted Dietz Architects, which is an outstanding architecture firm uh, in Springfield. Um, 
it's 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 sort of a an, an informal group that started and then the board of oversight sort of blessed it and um and chief pachorik in deerfield um has sort of taken the reins on this and i'm working closely with him to to, to see it happen um because the only way it's going to happen is if someone if someone really drives it with the help of of of, of others um mm -hmm. but it's 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 a the way it's structured is a smart way to do it. Yeah. Who else is on for from our town other than you? Then I don't think anyone because it's it's an it's an informal okay group. It is it, there is nothing formal or official about it, um, and I kind of like it that way. So it doesn't carry any authority. Yeah. No meeting requirements. <laughs> yeah, well, there will be. There will. Right. Be. I, I I like the idea of a needs assessment as well. And I just, uh, I guess we have to think about with this particular grant is all three towns should be putting it as their top number one so that maybe that will affect where the, how much funding you get or the chances of it happening if three towns really want to pool those funds for one project. Precisely. I think, and, and the needs assessment is great because Every time um, in the past that I've been in a part of a discussion about it, some people are just ranting and ranting about, oh, we need a new place, we need a new place. And other people will be in the room pouring cold water over it saying, we don't really need a new space. Right. So to get some outside idea of, you know, do we need it? Why do we need it? Here's the data that tells us why we need it. And so, and so on. I think that would bring a lot of clarity to a lot of people and help them get behind the idea of a, of a new senior center or uh, toss that and stop wasting time talking about it if we don't really need it. I, I the assessment is this this request for, idea. for projects would be for funding for what next fiscal year starting July, Brian? Is that what they're asking? I think I think FERCA can spend the money. Um, it's going to be in their work the, program now, don't they? To spend it, so yeah. No, it, it, I'm trying to think. It, it would be this fiscal year because it yeah. took forever to adopt the budget, but it would be it would be available probably now. Now, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, and this group is also they they met with Dietz Architects, and they've also met with somebody, uh, professor from UMass Boston, that's part of their. Um, I don't know what the I, the term escapes me, um, but. Um, I don't want to say geriatrics, but it, it's it's whatever department studies aging. Gerontology. Um, yes. Um, and they also have conversations with that professor who has done a, a, a number of needs assessments for a number of different towns. Um, so uh, there has been some discussions. It will, and a lot of it's driven by, by Deerfield's desire to, to find out what to do with the senior center building itself and also the the church next door. Right. Um, so th there's, there's some, yeah, and all options are, are on the table. All options are on the table. Bulldoze the things, whatever. No, There's no stupid idea at this point. Down the road, yeah, but not now. They looking at our center school as an option? That has just as many problems. No, I doubt, no problem I doubt they're looking at our center. It's, it's three levels. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, senior centers need to be on one level. Anyone who says, "Yeah, we're going to build a senior center," and we're, you know, and they're going to be really nice stairs. Well, what are you talking about? Yeah, you know, exercise no. room. They need exercise. One level. Okay. So, okay. Well, Brian, is there anything else on your updates list? I don't think so. Okay. And, well, I would move that we adjourn. Second. Okay. Roll call vote, Joyce. Hi. Jonathan? Yeah. Brad, yes. Okay, our next meeting is January 27th. All right. Thanks, everybody.